everyone, this is Bretta with the Arizona Humane Society and we are joined today by Dr. Stephen Hansen, the Arizona Humane Society's President and CEO. Um, and uh, he is a veterinarian, um, but also runs the show here at the Arizona Humane Society. And I don't know if many of you know, but March is actually Poison Prevention Month. So we're here today to talk about uh, household items as well as food items that are dangerous and those that aren't dangerous and are actually good for for your pet. So before we get started, Dr. Hansen, <laughs> oh, and I should should make sure we mention we have little foster puppies with us. These guys are just four, five weeks old. They're in foster homes right now, but we have little Grace here and we have Zoe as well. So again, not up for adoption for a few more weeks yet, but uh, they definitely are, are pretty darn cute. So Dr. Hansen, before we get started, tell us a little bit about your background in toxicology. Yes, Breda. So I'm also a board certified veterinary toxicologist. I actually, as part of my team for 16 years, was the ASPCA's Animal Poison Control Center. Uh, and we've spent a lot of time over the years um, talking poison prevention every month to try and keep more pets safe in homes. And how did you, how did that become your passion? It's just something that I was always interested in from veterinary school on. Um, toxicology is, is a fascinating um, subject and animals, uh, especially dogs can open just about any type of a packaging so they open pill vials they can open cabinets um, they get themselves into trouble so as a veterinarian it's very common to come across poisoning cases mm -hmm. now because of that the ASPCA has their poison prevention hotline tell us a little bit more about that so the ASPCA animal poison control center runs the premier animal poison control center in North America um, they can be reached at 888-426-443. Now we're probably going to talk about just some of the different, uh, some of the different items that you may encounter, and just kind of get your feedback on: should we be worried about these? Should we not? So Fantastic. we'll get started with some of those. Okay. All right. So first, we have some dry roasted macadamia nuts. So macadamia nuts are one of my favorites. We should be concerned when dogs consume macadamia nuts. Fairly small amounts of macadamia nuts can cause dogs to appear to be paralyzed in the back legs. What's most important is that poisoning by macadamia nuts um, will resolve. So if an animal chews macadamia nuts, a veterinarian should be communicated, but the most important thing is that they will recover. Okay, great to know. I had no idea about that. So Joanne on Facebook, thanks for uh, watching us live, was asking about mosquito plants. Mosquito plants. So, I'm not familiar specifically with a mosquito plant, but what I can recommend is go to the ASPCA's Animal Poisoning Control Center website. They've got an extensive list of both poisonous and non-poisonous plants. So I would go to the poisonous plant section and look up mosquito plant, but it is not one that comes immediately to my mind as a poisonous plant, but I would recommend um, that you do check. While we're on the subject of plants, there are some plants you really have to stay away from. What are some of those? So this time of the year, two plants that I always love to talk about are Easter lilies and related lily plants like tiger lilies and poinsettia plants. So true lily plants such as Easter lily and tiger lily are very toxic to cats. Um, these lily plants will produce kidney failure in cats and when cats chew on small amounts of the leaves. So it's very important that if, if somebody brings a bouquet into the house, uh, maybe it's a celebration or, or a gift um, that's being delivered. Make sure there are no lily plants if there are any cats in the house. I like to mention poinsettia because poinsettia in the past has been considered a poisonous plant. Um, in fact, if a dog chews up a poinsettia plant or a cat, we might get some stomach upset. But for the most part, poinsettias are not really toxic to dogs or okay, cats. Okay, but still keep them out of their... So keep them out of reach. We still want, don't want dogs and cats chewing on them. But it's Easter lily, tiger lily, these types of plants that are very serious. Okay. And then we always hear about or, or, oleander. Mm -hmm. Is that toxic? Are they not? What is your recommendation as far as those are concerned? So certainly oleander plants are technically toxic. And we have a lot of oleander plants here in Arizona. Uh, we don't want dogs chewing on that plant material, but most dogs won't in significant amount. Okay. Um, if some of those um, uh, bushes are trimmed and, and the trimmings are thrown over to livestock, that can be an issue. Okay. Um, so it's a can be much more of a large animal issue. So we don't want dogs chewing, chewing on oleander, but it's not a common toxicity. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Super helpful. All right. And now we here have a sweet potato. So sweet potatoes <laughs> are not toxic to dogs. <laughs> 
Um, cooked sweet potato um, does make a nutritious um, food for a dog. Um, so that's not one that we would worry about. We would not consider that toxic. All righty. What else do we have in here? A banana. banana. I'm not sure I would eat this banana, but... <laughs> it's like that banana has seen better days. <laughs> but um, let's say we had a very nice, beautiful banana. What is your recommendation? So for many dogs, um, banana in small amounts is actually a great treat for a dog and can be a reward. Okay. Oh. So one of my dogs loves banana, uh, but it's definitely not toxic. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, the, the fun just keeps on going. I know. What else do we have? Well, we're still on the... Uh, so peanuts. Like nuts. So peanuts are not toxic. Again, macadamia nuts. We don't want dogs eating. Um, no evidence at all that peanuts are a problem, and they can actually even be a reward in very small amounts for okay. some dogs. Now, are there other um, nuts that you would say yay or nay to in addition to these, or these are really going to be your, your main focal points? These are the main ones. Now, moldy nuts, such as moldy walnuts. So if, if, um, if somebody finds that they've got nuts that have been uh, in the cabinet way too long and they have mold on them, especially walnuts, those can be a problem. Mm. Um, but for the most part, other nuts are not typically a problem. Okay. We have no evidence in dogs or cats. All right. All right, Facebook community, where are your questions? We're here to answer them. So whatever you guys got, be sure to let us know. All right. Oh, I hear this one all the time. Yeah, so th this is an important one. And, and the Poison Control Center has been talking about grapes and raisins for many years now. Um, but poisonings still occur, so we don't know why, but dogs are very sensitive to grapes. Some dogs can consume grapes and never have a problem. Mm -hmm. um, most dogs, if they, if they ingest grapes, will have kidney problems. So we want no raisins and no grapes in dogs whatsoever. And I'm glad you mentioned the raisins, and I think Kelsey on Facebook had just asked that, so perfect timing. I hope you got your answer there, Kelsey. Thanks for, for tuning in. Perfect. We also have um, Joanne asking about onions. How okay. are onions for our furry friends, and does it differ between cats and dogs? So onions, when they occur as a problem, typically result when a dog has gotten into a large volume of onions. So if they chew up an entire onion or they eat discarded onion soup for some reason, um, that can cause a problem to both dogs or cats, but particularly dogs. It can cause a problem with their blood cells, um, but small amounts of onion are not a problem. So if a piece of onion falls on the floor, or if a dog gets a bite of a, of a hamburger with an onion on it, that is not an issue. It does take a significant amount um, but a large onion ingestion is a problem for dogs and, and cats, but okay. it's more likely a dog. And what if somebody notices this happens to their pet immediately, is there anything they can do for them at home, or do they need to immediately call the hotline, call their veterinarian to seek help? What would be the protocol for that? So what's real important to do at home is to um, first have an understanding of what the animal is chewed on. Mm -hmm. So we want, we want to know what, what symptoms are occurring, how much of something has been chewed on, uh, and then there are some tools that a pet owner can use. So the ASPCA Animal Poison Control Center has a wonderful app that can be downloaded for both a, an Android or Apple phone. Um, and the app will help you work through what, okay. what amounts are potentially toxic for okay. animals and when you should actually call somebody. Um, but an animal that's showing um, unusual symptoms, um, vomiting, diarrhea, um, trembling, or depression, um, that should trigger a phone call to either the Poison Control Center or your veterinarian. Okay, perfect advice. Thank you. And I know in one of these bags we have some of these, and I think Lisa just asked the same question, chocolate. Is chocolate um, poisonous to our furry friends? Um, is there a difference between the types of chocolate or the amount, really? So chocolate is a great thing to talk about, especially this time of the year as we head toward Easter, but any time of the year. For chocolate, it greatly depends on the type of chocolate. Okay. So for example, baking chocolate is a very potent type of chocolate. Okay. One ounce of baking chocolate in a small dog such as this could very easily be lethal. Wow. But one ounce of milk chocolate is probably not a problem. So the take home message is small amounts of typical milk chocolate mm -hmm. have very little real chocolate um, in those products and they're probably not a problem. Um, but as we get into dark chocolate and baking mm -hmm. chocolates, um, those types of chocolates can be very potent. Um, the symptoms that will typically occur will start with vomiting and diarrhea. Um, the dogs can become very depressed and have 
can even have tremors and seizures. Wow. Um, but again, it's the dose that's very important right. and the type of chocolate. Very scary. And one theme that I'm recognizing throughout this chat here is that the holidays, you know, you talk Easter lilies and poinsettias and baking chocolate and alcohol we haven't touched on, but the holidays can be really dangerous for our furry friends because a lot of these things are presented then. So these are, these are good tips to take uh, as we encounter those. And I think David had a question on Facebook about olives from backyard trees. I didn't know that uh, you have backyard trees that have olives, so. We have one in our front yard. Oh, you do. Yeah, that's right. Um, typically, olives are not going to present a problem that I'm aware of in dogs. They don't tend to eat large volumes of them. Um, and I'm not aware of those being significant problems. Okay. Along the same lines, avocados. We may even oh, have yeah. one. To talk yeah, about. we sure do. Um, so. so avocados um, also are, are questions that often come up. And avocados are really not a big problem for dogs. Uh, they are a concern if we've got rodents or birds. Okay. Um, but avocado injection ingestion doesn't typically involve much more than an upset stomach in a dog. So. Um, that's one that, that we um, do want to spend some time mm -hmm. um, talking about because there is information out there that might cause us to be more concerned about avocado. But a, an avocado ingestion in an average dog is not going to be a problem. Okay, yeah, that's a definite misconception that I had. I was always worried about that. I think I actually even called Dr. Hansen about a year ago because my mom's dog got into something and I was frantic. And at the end of the day, it was such a small amount we didn't have to worry about garlic. So garlic really fits in the same category as onion. Okay. It takes a significant garlic ingestion, but it will do the same thing to red blood cells. Okay. So it can cause a type of anemia. But again, the ingestion has to be fairly significant. Okay. Now a small amount of garlic or consuming a food that has garlic in it is not likely to be a problem. Okay, wonderful, good to know. Let's see what else we have. Now off the lines of, uh, you can't forget about our prescription medication, things that we have in our cabinets. I've known pets that are counter surfers. You know, tell us a little bit about how we can prevent against this and what really, I would assume all medications are really dangerous to, to our pets. Yeah, Brenda, talking about medications, human medications or animal medications for that matter, is very, very important. Um, Over-the-counter as well as prescription, one of the most common poisonings in dogs is ibuprofen because okay. we have a lot of ibuprofen mm -hmm. um, in our homes and we use it regularly. And dogs, for whatever reason, will sometimes chew up entire um, bottles of, of ibuprofen or any other prescription medication. The important thing to remember is that a child-proof container is not dog-proof. Mm -hmm. So the one that we have on example here is, is a typical child-proof container. Um, the average uh, Labrador Retriever will open that bottle in a matter of seconds. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to think about what a dog can do when you're poison-proofing your home. Okay. So pill vials have to be stored above the counter in a cabinet. Um, the other thing to keep an eye out on, especially if you've got visitors that are elderly, mm -hmm. are things like weekly um, pill minders that have the little, um, the, little vet, uh, the little wells with many mm -hmm. different pills put in them for the entire week. Those can be very problematic. Dogs get in, into those easily, mm -hmm. and now they're consuming a large amount of various types of medications, mm -hmm. which can be very complicated. So when you're, when you're poison proofing your home, realize that a dog is like a toddler that can open anything. They'll get cabinets open under the counter, um, so cleaning products should not be stored under the mm. counter. If you've got a dog, especially an inquisitive young dog like one of these puppies, you want cleaning products also stored above the counter. You want all medications of any type, uh, whether they're over the counter or prescription, in a medicine cabinet above the counter. You don't want anything on a nightstand. Um, dogs will find them. They're like toys. They rattle and they will get into them quickly. And it's amazing how many pills that a dog will consume. We've all tried to pill a dog before and it can right. be very difficult. And they don't want them and now suddenly they do once they are the ones that determine they want them. Exactly <laughs> right. When they, when they find it, it's a toy. Yeah. And the, the dose that a dog will consume will be staggering sometimes. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very careful with prescription drugs. We also want to poison proof the garage. Oh, um, yeah. Things like antifreeze. Um, can be very poisonous to dogs and cats in fairly small amounts, mm -hmm. damaging their kidneys. We also like to avoid um, other types of petroleum products such as um, gasoline, kerosene, um, uh, charcoal, lighter fluid. Those wow. types of products can all be dangerous as well. Uh, what can happen is a dog will actually, as they're chewing on those containers, they can get some of it in their lungs and damage their lungs. Mm -hmm. Um, paint is not a particularly toxic substance, but it can be very messy. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to keep all those products away. Um, lawn and garden products, 
um, such as um, <laughs> straight fertilizers are typically not a problem. It's when a fertilizer is combined with an insecticide mm -hmm. that we're much more concerned. So if the product is meant to kill something, such as insects or, um, or well, mostly insects, if it's a, a lawn product, um, we want to be very cautious with how we store those. But again, straight fertilizers and typical herbicides are also not a problem for okay. dogs. And is it true that antifreeze has like a sweet smell or taste to um, pets and that's why they would go for that or? There's some disagreement on whether it's okay. actually sweet, but there is agreement that dogs will consume it, dogs or cats. So whether they find it sweet or not, I'm not sure. Okay, um, you've never asked sure them, is that, that what you're telling us? Exactly <laughs> right, and make sure it, it's um, very important to keep it out of reach yeah. because that is a, a difficult toxicity to treat, mm. requires some special antidotes that can be difficult to find, okay. and are very easily fatal. Wow, okay. And then Lisa on Facebook also had a great question about outdoor toads. I know mm. in the Midwest we have this um, issue, concern. Is that mm. something to be concerned with with our pets? Yeah, so some out, some <clears throat> excuse me, outside toads, especially of the bufo species, okay. um, do have a special toxin. So um, some toads can cause poisoning, so we do want to be cautious. Um, that dog's mouth should be rinsed out um, carefully and immediately. We don't want to um, choke the dog with water from a hose, but you do want to rinse pretty thoroughly um, to get those toxins out of their mouth. And if there are any other symptoms, the dog needs to go to a veterinary hospital. Okay, wow. Well, really good information and great uh, questions, Facebook. Thanks for, for tuning in. Um, and again, what is the treatment? So if a pet gets to that point where we've had to call the poison hotline, we've had to get them into our veterinarian, what would happen next? I've, hear, I've heard charcoal mm -hmm. is something they're treated with, but tell us a little bit about that process. Yeah, Brad, so it, it does depend um, very specifically on the type of ingestion, the clinical signs that the pet is showing, um, and especially the dose. So what a veterinarian may do, if, if the ingestion is early, they may even recommend that you induce vomiting at home with a pet. Okay. Sometimes you want to empty the dog's stomach at home. It's always a good idea to have a fresh bottle of 3% hydrogen peroxide at home um, as part of your emergency um, stash for your pets and, well, just for your pets. Um, that way, if you're instructed by a veterinarian to administer it, you can. We can empty the stomach quickly. So sometimes they'll do that in a veterinary hospital if the inject ingestion is recent. Um, activated charcoal is very good, mm -hmm. especially with, um, with many different types of ingestions, especially medicines, if it's very soon after the ingestion. Um, so charcoal may be administered, and it is a charcoal-looking substance, a black, thick liquid, and it grabs onto toxins in the intestinal it tract. Takes it, takes it right on out. the system. Yep. A lot of times it really just requires supportive care. So dogs will be put on intravenous fluids, okay. um, kept warm and comfortable. If they've, um, if they've got something on their skin, it will be scrubbed off with a, a dish detergent. So okay. something like Dawn or Ivory. These guys are actually a litter of six and they will, they're will they in a foster home, they're just five weeks old, uh, but in an amazing foster hero home and they will be up for adoption in about three to four weeks, but they're getting all the love and care that they can possibly handle, but it is kitten season, you guys, it's puppy season, it's injured and ill dog and cat season, so we're always looking for foster homes. You can visit easyhumane.org slash foster. We even have online foster orientation, so you can do all of the training on your couch, get your certification and then come pick up some naughty little puppies so not up for adoption quite yet Joanne but great question so I'm trying to see do we have anything left I think we covered we talked about onions earlier so if I were just to break it down here now let's see if I got this right on what macadamia nuts are bad the pills are bad this is the mild chocolate so I'm gonna put that in the okay pile this is our bad pile over here, and then we have our not so bad pile, but still just be careful um, with these items. I'm not sure. I'm still not sure about this banana where that should go, but um, but that kind of breaks down just some of the things that we talked about, the things that you really want to be careful with, and again, small amounts of these. You don't need to panic, um, but again, for the most part, just keep your pets uh, getting the normal things that pets could should give. Other really good treats for them we kind of touched on. Um, you mentioned some of these things are nice treats, but I think carrots in small quantities, green beans that are frozen are a good, mm -hmm. um, healthy treat for pets. So just be thinking of some of those things um, as 
as well. So anything else that you want to add today? Well, probably the only thing we didn't cover are things like mouse poison. So okay. mouse poison is a common call to poison control centers. Oh, okay. It's important to realize that dogs and cats, just like rodents, will eat mouse poisons. Oh, okay. So you want to make sure that there is no way, if you're using a mouse poison, that your pet can get to the mouse poison. Um, they are treated in different ways depending on the type of mouse poison. So if you do have a dog that ingests it, you want to make sure you know exactly what was ingested when you talk to your veterinarian or your poison control center. And you bring up a good point there because we also have a working cat program and we actually have cats that um, people can adopt. They're not in suitable for indoor living. They simply don't like to be held and they've lived outdoors. and. They can fend for themselves, but um, these working cats go and live in pairs in barns and warehouses and ranches, and they offer a uh, non-toxic poison control to keep um, rats and mice away. So that's another thing that people could do and just keep the poisons out of their home altogether. That would so, be the best approach. Yes, and you're like saving that. the lives of cats right, right along with it. So later today, we're going to actually have more information on our blog at azhumane.org slash news. So uh, be sure to check that out as well. And in the meantime, keep your, your pets, your cats, your dogs, your livestock, keep them safe. And thank you, Dr. Stephen Hansen, for joining us. We know you have a crazy busy schedule, but thanks for sharing your expertise with uh, all of our fans out there. Well, thank you, Brada. Yeah.